Good. So it's lovely to be here again. Really, really nice. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Yeah. Thank you. I really enjoy coming here, as you know. <laughs> and uh, thank you for leading the meditation. It was beautiful. So lovely. And um, I'm sure I can touch on that during the uh, little presentation. I wanted to talk about mindfulness today. And uh, partly because I have a retreat coming up soon in um, London Insight. <coughs> and gold is green for the day. And um, rather than tell people, you know, mindfulness is not enough, I entitled the retreat, Is Mindfulness Enough? <laughs> so it's kind of implied in the question, but, um, you know, mindfulness is such a popular uh, movement at the moment in the West. And, you know, there are advantages and perhaps some disadvantages to that both. Um, and perhaps it's a beginning stage, you know, in understanding what mindfulness is. Um, but it's certainly often taken outside the context of the Buddha's um, teaching on mindfulness, which is very rich and very broad, um, and has different levels. Mindfulness is not just one thing. You know, if we ask ourselves, kind of, what we do in our everyday life, like, are we mindful or are we not mindful? To some extent, we're aware, you know, of what we're doing. We're often aware. Otherwise, we'd, you know, probably be falling over ourselves and losing our keys everywhere, which, you know, happens from time to time. But it's not just awareness. So mindfulness in the Buddha's teaching has, a, I guess you can define it first of all as a kind of presence of mind, so the mind that is aware in the present moment rather than being dragged <coughs> off to the past and the future. But it also implies a kind of what's become known as a bare awareness. And I think uh, the more beautiful meaning of bare awareness is the kind of mindfulness that arises just as pure cognition of an object or of a phenomena such as somebody's speech or appearance. It's that initial sense impression that we get where there's no interference from what we call the hindrances in the mind. But of course in everyday life that we often don't have this kind of clarity and this bare cognition at all. We have all these kind of uh, interpretations or um, kind of embellishments going on, you know, so something arises and past memories arise, so say I see a person and it's like, you really remind me of your mother, and you know, then it depends on the relationship with your mother, whether you have a positive association with that person or not, or even what you notice about that person might be different, you might only notice that their voice reminds you of your mother, you know, you won't see other aspects of the person. So in Buddhism, the Buddha taught very clearly that um, mindfulness is only really reliable when the five hindrances are absent. Do you know what the five hindrances are, or shall I go through them? So the Buddha defined the hindrances as um, obscurations of the mind which weaken wisdom. And also in the text it talks about the five hindrances <coughs> as nourishments for delusion. So it's something that actually feeds delusion it's distorting the truth, it's distorting our perception, our cognition. And the five hindrances are the things we experience every day in different degrees. So they start off with craving or wanting. Sometimes it's um, called sense desire, but it's, it's really wanting in a very broad sense. So wanting something to be other than it really is, you know. This distorts the reality, you know. Or we project a certain fantasy onto a situation or a person, it distorts the actual reality of the situation. The next one is um, aversion. Sometimes it's um, described as hatred, but I think that's a bit too strong. It's any kind of turning away or repulsion or out of aversion, not out of wisdom, a kind of rejection of, of reality. And this is, um, I think, very common probably at the deeper insights of meditation unless you've developed a very clear mind because we simply don't want to see the truth the Buddha was talking about, you know, truths such as impermanence and non-self. It feels repulsive to us. We don't want to see that, you know, so the mind will tend to avoid seeing that truth out of a kind of aversion, out of negativity, or fear also comes under that, yeah? So these two are the main ones and these are often talked about reference just these two but it, it refers to the whole five whenever these two are referenced so the other three are kind of aspects of that so the first um, of the other three is uh, sloth and torpor very old language for drowsiness and kind of sluggish laziness 
of the mind. These are all mental qualities. Um, and then, and then, what is it? Sloth and torpor, doubt. That's another one. Restlessness. Restlessness. Quite a common one. So restlessness is like you don't want to stay with the object. The mind sees something, but then it just runs, runs off. So with restlessness, we can never hold something in mind long enough to really penetrate its nature. And with sloth and torpor, you know, we just don't see. You know, it's like uh, the Buddha likens it to sort of pond that's really cloudy. You know, you can't see anything in there. So they're the five hindrances. And, you know, in a way, the whole perp one of the main purposes of um, awareness or mindfulness is to overcome these five hindrances. And there's different degrees throughout the path. Um, by which they overcome them. So in the beginning we just restrain them temporarily and later on we overcome them completely. So the idea of bare awareness is kind of a little bit unrealistic to my mind, you know, because it, it assumes that we're actually seeing things as they are when we're, of, you know, often not. And uh, I think the other reason bare awareness sounds a little bit um, lacking to me is to do with what you were just teaching, Richard. You know, I think kindness and developing a kind of happiness in the mind before we actually move on to our meditation object is really important, and that's what you were trying to do. You were setting us up with this beautiful imagery and kind of the feelings, you know, getting us to imbibe the feelings of being in the presence of a Buddha. It also helped to overcome the hindrances of fear or, you know, tiredness with something very engaging. And also um, a kind of aversion. I find it very helpful to picture the tiger and the deer, you know, because normally we'd be afraid or have a kind of <gasps> from a tiger, but in that context it felt very safe. And I imagine the deer and the tiger being aspects of my own mind, you know, the side that I find very easy to embrace and the side that's maybe more difficult. So I found that very uh, skillful sort of imagery. Um, and it's interesting because kindness actually comes as a second factor in the noble path, way, way, way before mindfulness in the development and in the training. So, you know, it's about establishing right attitude, a really wholesome attitude with whatever we experience. And the main factors of that are kindness, basically, metta, kindness, non-ill will. And the next one is gentleness, which I think is really important for us, because often we sort of, you know, we bring this kind of doing mind into the practice. And as soon as we sit, it's like, okay, I've got to kind of get something, achieve something, or work something out, you know. Or if there's a difficult sensation, it's like, let me see what's going on there. <laughs> sometimes we really penetrate it with our mind. And sometimes all it needs is like a very gentle kind of, okay, let me just see, how are you feeling right now? You know, like really gentle touch. So yeah, the kindness, the gentleness, and the letting go. These are the right intentions. Letting go is not grasping after anything. Yeah. So this comes way, way, way earlier on the path, even than mindfulness. Um, Ajahn Brown called, yeah, he's changed the word bear awareness for bear awareness, B-E-A-R. His new book is called B-E-A-R Awareness. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the ways he develops that is by having these fluffy teddy bears for people to meditate with, which is a very popular method, I have to say. <laughs> Because the bear's still, but it's also soft. <laughs> yeah. And also sometimes he calls um, mindfulness kindfulness, which is also a very skillful employment of uh, language, you know, just to add that extra kindness in there. And this immediately, again, it's undermining these hindrances. So it's, it's kind of setting up the right attitude from the beginning. So, yeah, the other really important thing to mention about mindfulness, I think, is that it's um, there are different levels, as I said before. So the first one is just <coughs> a kind of present moment awareness, which you did in the beginning also, which is just like being here and being present to whatever is here right now. And that's a very preliminary kind of mindfulness, which is maybe what's taught in the mindfulness movement. But then further on in the training, after developing ethics and virtue, we find another kind of awareness or mindfulness which is coupled with wisdom. That's called satisampajanya. And the Buddha always used these two terms together. So it's not just about being mindful or what you're mindful of, it's also how you're mindful of it and why. So it's about looking at purpose. Is what I'm aware of 
going to fulfill a, a purpose that's aligned with the Dhamma. Yeah? So we can be mindful, for example, of holding a gun and aiming it. But is that really mindfulness with wisdom? It, it's not using mindfulness in the way the Buddha intended. So there is this ethical element to mindfulness. So it's understanding the purpose of what we're doing. Is it aligned to the Dhamma? Is it, a, you know, is it bringing us out of suffering or not? Is it leading us to happiness or not? And then how suitable, suitability is the next one, like how suitable is what we're doing or what we're aware of to achieving our goal. So for example, some people say, you know, mindfulness means being aware of your meditation object 24 hours or 12 hours if you need to sleep, you know. <laughs> so for example, you know, sometimes people come out of retreats and they're always warned, be really careful when you get in the car. Because when you're driving, you know, you need to be aware of the traffic. Like, don't stay with your breath at that time. <laughs> yeah? So we might think we're mindful, but is that suitable for the purpose? The purpose we're aiming for is to arrive home safely and, you know, not kind of cause accidents and other people to not arrive home safely. So it's about purpose and suitability. There's a, a kind of powerful and slightly shocking story in the Buddhist texts about um, a whole group of monks, I think probably about 500, because there were a lot of monastics in those days. Now you just get one coming to Brentwood. <laughs> 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 but um, they all took up the object, another mindfulness object, which is the object of um, unattractiveness, let's say. And they were using that to look at their own body and to... I mean, actually, the purpose of that object is to overcome lust. So if one has a lot of lust, a lot of maybe passion for the body and for sensual pleasures, it can be useful to look at the body and say, okay, what is it, actually? It's skin, it's bones, it's blood, it's flesh. There are legs, there are you know, knees. Actually, it's the, more the internal body parts that they look at. And uh, these monks were using this object, and they became so kind of uh, distressed about the condition they were in, you know, about the body, about the fact that it's subject to decay and what it looks like, quite disgusting, that they committed suicide. <laughs> they all committed suicide. All of them? Yeah, wow. all of them. 500? Well, something like this. I'm not sure of the figures. <laughs> well, well, <laughs> <laughs> Even the, the books aren't really sure, I think. <laughs> but um, obviously this was quite a shocking incident, you know, and the Buddha was called upon and it was like, what's happened here? And I think what happened, basically, was that they were using it in the wrong way because it's useful if you have too much loss, but if you have already like a lot of self-hatred or a lot of aversion, it, it's precisely the wrong object to use. In that case, you need to take an object of metta, of loving kindness, mm -hmm. or beauty. There is actually a practice of subba, which means focusing on the beautiful. So like looking at objects in a way that brings beautiful qualities to mind, which is suitable if one has more of an aversive type of character. So suitability is really important. And then another aspect of the wisdom going along with mindfulness is um, suitability and knowing the range of practice. And I like to think of this as um, kind of knowing the, how to meditate in different situations in life. So as I said before, it's not that we focus on our breath when we're driving or focus on our breath when we're talking to someone else. You know, I've had experiences with people who are in serious meditation and you have a conversation and there's a sense that they don't really want to be there with you, you know, that you're distracting them from their breath. <laughs> so this is another kind of, yeah, not being able to adapt the mindfulness to the various situations. So knowing the range, knowing the field of mindfulness is good. And, um, yeah, another way you can think of that is the distance from the object. I don't know if this is getting a bit technical, but they're all quite interesting aspects <coughs> of mindfulness. So it's like with a kind of more generalized awareness we are quite distant from the object so at the moment you're all quite distant from me i'm quite distant from you so i see people's face as a kind of, of a, as a face outside so it's a object at the eye sense door for me so you're coming in at my eye sense door and i see sight so i'm not very very close to that it's kind of more um distant from the object so I'm aware very much of sound, of colour, of things that are coming into my senses, but not necessarily of the feelings in the body 
around that. And that's very, very suitable um, for general daily life. And the idea of that is, the idea of sense restraint, actually, that the Buddha taught, is not to avoid sights and sounds, but to perceive them in the way that leads to wholesome states arising and unwholesome states decreasing. So it's kind of being able to handle the sense data coming in and tune our perception in, in a way that decreases our suffering. So it's a bit like I was saying before with somebody who reminds you of someone you have aversion to. It's like looking for the good side in that person. yeah. Because our minds are so tuned up to kind of looking for what's wrong, looking for the faults. And it's just perceiving in a different way. Or if you sort of smell something very delicious and you start to see that you get you know, a lot of craving, just try to kind of change your perception of that somehow. It's, it's kind of dealing with the sense data in a way that gives rise to wholesome states and not unwholesome states. So that's one kind of way of mindfulness that we can practice in everyday life without having to be completely absorbed in the object, just noticing it coming in to the senses. Yeah? And then a slightly closer one, so you can see that as the object here and the, and the sense you know, con the sensors or the sense objects are over here. Is that right? No, the mind's here and the sense objects are over here, yeah? So this is the mind. And so the next one is coming in a bit closer and that's the satisampajanya, the, the mindfulness with wisdom that understands the purpose, understands the suitability, understands what we're doing and why we're doing that, yeah? So this also doesn't have to be on the cushion but it's a little bit more starting to go inside and looking at our intentions, looking at our motivations for why we do what we do. Yeah? So this idea of, you know, sometimes they talk about um, mindfulness for beginners, like being mindful of eating chocolate. Well, okay, but is that, why are we doing that? <laughs> is it just to get more enjoyment out of it, or is it because, you know, we're trying to get enlightened and sort of see how the defilements are arising? Usually it's the first one. <laughs> yeah? So this is, anyway, the next kind of a little bit closer. And then when you get into really deep meditation, samadhi states, the mu and this is when the hindrances are much more reduced and mindfulness is very strong, you can actually kind of become one with the object. So the mind and the object are very close. You absorb into the object so that they become one. It's like in states of, um, often this can be developed by practices of Brahma Viharas, metta, loving kindness or compassion or breath meditation and it gets to a point where the object and the mind start to almost meld together so the mind becomes very bright and as a result the breath becomes very bright and then the two start to be almost yeah you can't really differentiate and they absorb into each other so the mind becomes very big and bright and you experience the breath with the mind at that point you don't experience it it as a physical phenomenon anymore. So this is when the two are very, very close, like together, like this. But at that time you can't investigate, because you're too close. So you need to move out a little bit, and at this point it's like, this is where the mindfulness of, say, the Satipatthana comes in. And the Satipatthana Sutta is the one that most people know, the Sutta on the f um, four focuses, my teacher likes to call it, the four fields of mindfulness. And the four fields are mindfulness of the body, of the feelings, of the mind, and of the mental contents. And this is a practice which is usually done either when the hindrances are very restrained, very, very weak, or after the samadhi states. So the mind at that time is really powerful and it's free from these obscurations, you know, that weaken wisdom, or curtains. I think the word for hindrances in Pali means curtains that veil the truth. So the mind's free from that after the jhanas or just before the jhana states, which are the samadhi states. No? So at this stage, mindfulness is so strong that it actually can see the arising and passing away of phenomena. So this is a stage further than simply understanding the qualities of phenomena, whether there's hot or there's cold in the body, or whether there's pain or, you know, a pleasant sensation. It's actually seeing that all these things are arising and passing constantly and are subject to cessation. So this is a deeper level of mindfulness and a much more powerful level. And I think this is what we're aiming for with the practice of mindfulness. So it begins just as this present moment awareness, you know. It progresses as a kind of 
awareness, with understanding the purpose, understanding the suitability of what we're doing, yeah, and whether it's taking us towards our goals, which are hopefully aligned to the Dhamma of you know coming out of suffering, and then deepening that through progressively purifying the mind through sila, through virtue. And virtue is also the positive aspect of virtue, not just I will not kill, I will not steal, etc., etc., but I will act out of compassion, you know, with a mind of compassion. What is it? The words exactly, I think the Buddha uses it. Um, with rod and weapon laid aside, one dwells with compassion to all living beings, something like that. So it's an active, you know, participation in wholesome actions. So we constantly, constantly refine this and then it will purify our minds more and more to develop deeper mindfulness. So with this, you know, we have a chance to develop deeper and deeper samadhi states, like calm abidings in the mind. And after those calm abidings, then the mindfulness is really powerful. Ajahn Brown calls it superpower mindfulness. <laughs> so he says there's just mindfulness... And then power mindfulness, when it's getting quite strong and you're starting to sort of experience maybe vibrations or, you know, in the body and things are starting to dissolve or you're starting to see maybe like where your reactions are coming from, maybe catching them earlier, this kind of thing. It's starting to get strong and objects seem more beautiful. The sun shines brighter, the, the green of, you know, the leaves is greener than ever before. This is getting power mindfulness. But then after the deeper states of meditation, you get super power mindfulness. And it's this point where the Buddha says you can see things as they really are. Yeah. So the Pali for that is samadhi pachaya yata bhutanyana dasana. It means that seeing things as they really are is caused by samadhi. Or samadhi is the cause of seeing things as they really are. So at that point the mind is so strong and yet very soft and malleable. I like that word malleable. He uses this. <coughs> and non-biased as well is a really good word, and fit for work, so the mind's ready, it's very steady also, wieldy, that's another word he uses, so you can kind of mould it whichever way you want, and you don't have any kind of biases towards what you see, it's not like, okay, now I can see self, I can see who I am, you don't have any idea of this, maybe you're someone, maybe you're not, you know, maybe there's something there, maybe there's not, <laughs> mm -hmm. the mind is so open and receptive, and then we have a chance, you know, to see things as they truly are. So that's the kind of, in very brief, <laughs> kind of just to give a little bit of more of a context to mindfulness, which I think is a much talked about subject, but perhaps there are elements of it that we haven't really fully kind of worked with or considered or applied in our daily life as well as our practice on the cushion. Yeah? So I just wanted to talk about this a bit today, and I didn't read out the... Uh, quote, but I mean, why not read it at the end, I guess, because <laughs> I quite like this one as, um, as, as a kind of definition, I guess you could say, of mindfulness, because it shows other aspects of mindfulness too, and it also taps into what I was saying about um, restraining, so not only just letting everything come into the mind, but letting, thing, letting the wholesome states come in, and keeping the unwholesome states out is part of the job of mindfulness. So this comes from the Anguttara and Nikaya, which is one of the um, Pali texts. Huge book like this, if you want to. <laughs> it's a very nice one, actually. <laughs> Your face. <laughs> <laughs> but what's really nice about this book, actually, is that you can search in the index for various subjects. So if you want to see yeah. mindfulness, it gives you every reference in the whole text on that. And you can get a really big picture. So I like this one, anyway. It's called The Simile of the Fortress. Just like a gatekeeper in the king's frontier fortress is wise, competent and intelligent, one who keeps out strangers and admits acquaintances for protecting inhabitants and warding off outsiders, a noble disciple is mindful, possessing supreme mindfulness and alertness, one who remembers and recollects what was done or said a long time ago. With sati, that's mindfulness, as a gatekeeper, a noble disciple abandons the unwholesome and develops what is wholesome, abandons the blameworthy and develops what is blameless. Yeah? 
So I find that quite nice. And the other part of mindfulness that that touches on, actually, which I haven't mentioned yet, is um, is remembering and recollecting. Because the uh, meaning of mindfulness, sati, I think in Sanskrit is smriti, right? Which means memory. It means memory, right? And I think this is a kind of memory in the sense that we remember what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah? Because we all know we should be mindful, we should be mindful, but we forget all the time. <laughs> and this is one of the main things. So it's a kind of remembering, you know, what the instructions are, how to practice skillfully. That's why it's helpful to listen to the Dhamma again and again. It's the same thing we've heard time and again, but it's a reminder, <laughs> you know. So, And here it's interesting because it says that, you know, if you're mindful, you're one who remembers and recollects what was done or said a long time ago. So maybe teachings we heard a long time ago, you know, we all have enough theory, you know, you're just complaining about books and it's because we're up to here with theory, you know, but do we remember, do we get the experience, like do we get the, the feeling for what we've read and why it's important? And uh, I think this is really key and another way you can use that in the practice, which might be helpful in daily life, is um, a kind of setting up or a programming of your intention. Yeah. So there's another sutta. Maybe I can find it um, here. Yeah, which uh, talks about a way that you can kind of set up an intention for yourself for the day. Yeah. I mean, these are the Buddha's words, or maybe one of the disciples' words. Um, but you can find your own words, you know. And it says, um, yeah. One bent on her own welfare should practice heedfulness, mindfulness, and guarding of the mind in four instances. May my mind not become excited by things that provoke lust. May my mind not be full of hate by things that provoke hate. May my mind not be full of delusion by things that pro provoke delusion, or intoxicated by things that provoke intoxication. Yeah? So it's a kind of remembering what we aim for, what we're trying to get to, and programming ourselves. And this is very powerful when you're actually in meditation, let's say at the end of your practice. That's why we do may all beings be happy, you know. Mm. But we can also sort of say, okay, today, I know my weakness is that I get annoyed when I see this person, or when I get to work I start speeding up too much and forgetting to take breaks, you know. May I remember, may I pause during my day. May I remember to pause during my day you say this to yourself and then you set yourself up with that intention because we can't always remember during the day but if you put that in there it's like you you're kind of conditioning yourself in a different way so I think that's a really helpful tip in our daily mm. lives mm. and uh, maybe in you know also I'd, I'd say do med meta meditation mm. at the end or, or at the beginning of every sit but at least for five minutes a day do the meta meditation because this really sets us up with our right intention and then whatever we look at appears to us in a much more beautiful way. We have a much softer kind of perception, far less judgmental, and it undermines all of the hindrances. Yeah? So, so that's all for me. So I'd really <coughs> welcome any kind of questions or comments or discussion I have, I have on that. What was the meta, <coughs> meta meditation? <laughs> Sorry. Just want to wait till everybody's with us. Yeah. What is meta meditation? Meta meditation. Yes. We're using the Pali. <laughs> meta is loving kindness. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Oh. May all beings be well and happy. Oh, yes. May all beings be free from suffering. <laughs> May all beings be peaceful. But it's not the words that there's, that's the meta. It's it's where the words are pointing to that's the meta, and I think this is really key important to remember. So we can practice by beginning with this kind of intention and the phrases, that's one way. Another way is to kind of establish a beautiful image in the mind or perhaps bring to mind a friend or someone that's that you love very dearly but in a very pure kind of way, like there's not a big struggle with that person, it's a very you know, giving relationship, there are no kind of obstacles there towards well-wishing and you bring them up in your mind and, and kind of establish this intention towards them and get that feeling. So when you say the words, you feel it in your heart. Mm. And it's, a, again, a very gentle cultivation. It's not like, may you be happy and may I feel it, you know, it's not like that. 
Heavy metal. <laughs> Sorry? I said that's heavy metal. Oh, heavy metal. <laughs> 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 I said heavy metal. <laughs> a few of us had dinner at, at Anna's the other night, uh -huh. and, the, and she asked us to choose some stones. Mm. And these stones during the week were to remind us yeah. um, to be grateful. Oh. And the stone is sitting on my table. Yeah. And I can be doing anything, and I see my stone, oh. and I immediately ask yeah. myself, what am I grateful for now? Beautiful, yeah. 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 So this is following yeah, even an object can mm -hmm. remind you of visible right, things. Right, yeah, that's lovely. Thank you. That's lovely. And talking of that, gratitude is also one of these Brahma Viharas. There's four. First one is loving kindness, next it's compassion. Next it's mudita, which is often not talked about, and this is a kind of simple well. I don't like that translation. Often they say sympathetic joy, but it's more like rejoicing joy. And I think of that as a kind of gratitude also. It's quite related to gratitude. So it's say when we remember beautiful things or good things in life and we really take time to rejoice in that. Yeah? So that's a kind of, yeah, really important practice and an instant source of happiness, actually. It, it does make you yeah. feel happy instantly. Yeah. To yeah. just remember something you're grateful for. Yeah. Mm. In the, what am I grateful for in this moment? Yeah, yeah. You know, that's, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. I don't know if that's what you've been doing with them. No, I'll be buying a car. I will be grateful. And I have a Well, I'm grateful I've got you as my friend. Oh. Oh. <laughs> you can get in my car. <laughs> <laughs> can I get in your car? <laughs> yourself when you've remembered to be. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It, yeah. Makes you feel happy. I think it was I was listening to Russell Brand today and he was saying about happiness. You can buy a pleasure, but you can't buy happiness. The happiness has to come to yeah. the inside. Yeah. It's priceless. And there's so many ways actually again you're just pointing out more aspects of mindfulness that we haven't talked about yet because there's a practice called Chaganu Sati. And Anu Sati, Sati means mindfulness, mm. so it means like something that goes along with Sati. And another one of those is reflecting on your own virtue, your own goodness, your own um, gifts in life, really. Yeah. And it's in the ego when you do that. I think. You don't need to, yeah. actually. It's not the same. It's interesting because a lot of people, I think, especially in Western cultures, feel that that goes very much against the grain because we're not supposed to kind of celebrate ourselves. But I think this is different because it's not about taking it as ourself who's so great it's more looking at the things we've done for others the service that we've done our intentions throughout the day and just bringing it up in our mind and really like learning to appreciate that and value that not as something that's like specific to us but just you know seeing that this kind of intention produces good results if you see what I mean it has to be worked on that one I yeah think. it has to be worked on and it's something that I think you know is so good for everyone to practice I mean, Ajahn Brahm always says that's the way he got through the first years when he moved to Australia and he was busy actually building the monastery, like physical busy. Um, and he said, you know, he was doing so much good karma during the day, he would have just been tired at the end of the day. But then he'd sit on his cushion and bring up, bring to mind all those things, not that I have done, but just this is going to benefit people, this is going to create a monastery where people are going to come you know, and developing Dhamma and just bringing that up. It's like getting a, a sense, again, of purpose and what we're doing this for, you know. Mm. It's, it's kind of like inspiring yourself to keep doing good. Mm. It's kind of like that. And I said to one of my friends in Perth at one time, she said, she said, oh, you're doing so much good coming. You must be full of energy and happiness. I said, oh, no, I'm just tired. She said, what? <laughs> you mean you don't sit down and, you know, think about it and really milk it? What a waste. <laughs> what a waste <laughs> so I mean that keeps me going with my project because I'm so so busy but I just keep on reflecting wow every time that I have another email to answer and Anna saw my emails it's like every two minutes literally literally I can't keep on top at the moment because we're booking for a retreat and it's just and it's like every time there's another email it's like if I can answer this person even if it takes four or five emails to work out their particular, you know, kind of requirements to join the retreat, 
this is a person who's going to come from a retreat and hear the Dhamma from someone that I really trust as an excellent Dhamma teacher. And it can change their life, you know. Mm. And it's like if we can give them a bit of extra space on the floor to lie down because they have a bad back, it's like we'll try and do that. You know, we'll try and make that mm. possible. Or if someone can't afford to come, I mean, we do have some bursary funding, but not very much at the moment. We only have about £400, and we basically have two people who want to use the whole thing. I mean, who need to use the whole thing and can't pay straight away. So it's like, if we can set up another ticket where they can have a delayed payment, we'll try and do that. You know? And it, it just gives me so much joy to be able to, even though it's more work, it's also more joy. Because you know that you're trying to... You're really trying to serve. So it's bringing that up. It's not about I'm trying to serve. It's just about, gosh, people are going to get the Dhamma through this uh, through this work that I'm doing. You know? And that that's actually less ego-driven. If it was about me getting a, my monastery and getting a name for myself, that would be a worry. But it's more like through this project, you know, people are coming to the Dhamma. Let me pause to really reflect on that and get a sense of what that means because that's amazing. Yeah. <coughs> Question. How have you, you handled criticism? Have you criticised yeah. for anything? I mean, yeah. We, we all come into this. There's different ways. I mean, I think the best way for any of this is to develop metta within oneself because it's kind of protection. And when you have a very um, loving and soft and peaceful mind and a lot of nourishment within yourself, criticism doesn't hurt so much. I mean, you might notice, for example, if you're really tired, if you've had a really bad day, you're really, really tired, and somebody says something, even if it's not particularly critical, it really hurts. Yes. You feel it. But if you're really in a happy mood, if you're on holiday or whatever, everything's going well in your life, you know, you feel full of love, full of kind of benevolence for beings, and somebody says something, you might not even notice. You're quite right. Yeah. So I think there's a, you know, our perceptions are based on our mental state at the time, so the first thing to do is to kind of improve our own mental state. But then I also think through the practice of mindfulness and understanding how negative states arise within ourselves and how we feel when we're angry or when we're fearful or frightened, how much we suffer, you know, or when we feel critical towards others, how contracted that is, you know, how small we feel in a way, because we can't see the bigger person, we can't see the whole person, we realise then that we suffer. When we're critical, we suffer. And then you can kind of, you know, extend that to another. It's like, if another person's critical, they're suffering, that's why. They're suffering, they're struggling with something, and it's coming out as criticism. But it's really more a reflection of where they're at than where you're at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that puts certainly a different picture on it. Yeah. It's easier to um, tolerate. Yes, yes. Because even the Buddha was criticised, you know. I think the other thing we can tend to do when we criticise is think, OK, now I've got to make sure no one could criticise me again, I've got to be better at this, better at that, improve myself, da, da, da. And that's just, you know, internalising it and using it to sort of, yeah, develop a very poor self-image, and that's not helpful at all. Yeah, it really is more about them than it is about you. Learning the art of not being offended. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> I, got, I got that. That's not mine. Learning the art of not being offended. Yeah. I Lovely, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. But I think when we are offended or when we do feel hurt, it's also sometimes that's the time to practice compassion and just say, ouch, that hurt, you know. That really hurt. Like, I don't think I really deserve that. Let me just kind of, yeah, let me just kind of be kind to myself for a moment, <laughs> you know. Like, yeah, it hurt. Acknowledge that. Because that's a softening rather than a kind of <laughs> how dare they, you know? Because when you go, when you react like that, you feel the ego kind of Absolutely. sense of self just. But you see, it needs a lot of training. It needs a lot of training, and that's why we were talking about right effort is the is the factor right before mindfulness, because it's training in developing the wholesome states and keeping out the negative ones and increasing the wholesome. And it's about how we look at things. So just from saying what I just said, it's like just thinking of another way to see the situation. It's like you have to go around the back or around the side. We need to do that. We need to cultivate a different way of looking. And it doesn't matter if it's correct. It's just if I look in this way, does it lead to more happiness or more suffering? If it leads to more suffering, find a different way to look at it. Yeah.
the Buddha said in the suttas in I think Dagunikaya, the long discourse of bat number eight, I don't know, he said um, that basically the path is a training in perception. That's what it is. It's the training in perception. To increase the wholesome states as much as possible until we can clear the five hindrances and then we can see things as they really are. Until then, we don't really see things as they are anyway, so why not try to see them in a way that's more helpful? Yeah. I just um, finished reading a book by a woman who went from being an English banker to uh -huh. a Buddhist nun, oh, and right. spending a lot of time in Bhutan. Yeah. And she says that the purpose of the practice is to help all sentient yeah. beings. Yeah. Do you yeah. go with that? Or? Yeah, absolutely. And the only difference, I'd say, is that we understand, I guess, in Theravada, it's known as understanding that that starts by helping yourself. Um, or it's not separate from helping yourself. You know, we need to develop those qualities within ourselves so we have something to share with others. So we can help others all along the path, and I think we have to. But sometimes we need solitary time also to mm. really give some kind of... Because I'm serving non-stop, but I still take my three months every year mm. at least. I'm taking a month next month, three months over the reins, to really kind of strengthen and cultivate my mind. And after that, I can serve much better. But yeah, I think having that compassion, like we said before, compassion is the starting ground, really. Yeah, and the, that's the, the right element, intention for the path. The, the element of compassion, yeah. some of us were discussing recently, the desire to help others yeah, and yeah. the need to, at times, observe when that is actually not helping, yeah, when it's yeah, actually yeah. time to step back. Absolutely. And um, yeah. you know, observing like energy vampires, we might describe them more. Yeah. It's quite interesting, isn't yeah, it? And it is. Also, I've been reflecting on, on that in relation to karma. Mm -hmm. I've sort of realised that, what well, seems to me anyway, that you can't ever actually change somebody's karma. No, no, you know, no. I have no. a friend who's a stroke survivor, and I was with her on Sunday, and mm. she was just in such a state, mm. screaming, yelling, and the mm. carers couldn't do anything. Mm. And I, I suppose in a way I was quite pleased I could just stand there and not be sucked in, but it's quite difficult mm, to see difficult, someone you yeah. care about really suffering and yeah. nothing that anyone seems to do seems to help be able to change mm. the whole mm. scenario it's just mm. not just her it's the house mm. and the family it's sure. like just yeah I mean I guess sometimes we have to focus just on our intention in the moment rather than the effect it's going to have because we don't know but what I really trust is that whenever we have kind intention it does bear fruit whether even if you don't see mm. it but it does. I mean, even if that person at least feels that they're not in danger, you're already serving in that way, or they're not alone. Mm. But if we have a certain expectation which is maybe unrealistic, then yeah, it can be extremely exhausting. Mm. I think it's but really... It's, yeah, some people's karma is very, yeah. very heavy, isn't it? Yeah. Just like, well, I mean, I'm always change. a bit cautious about calling it their karma. I mean, it's not necessarily the result of anything they've done in the past necessarily sometimes I mean the Buddha said that you know there are different reasons for the situations we encounter and yeah. some of them are due to past karma but some of them are due to things like accidents or um, weather I think is one of them kind of unforeseen circumstances oh, right, yeah. yeah so that's and also, also important to realize because I think yeah it can happen to anybody you know because there's always many other people involved yeah. in a scenario like that aren't there and one <coughs> right. like the whole scenario yeah absolutely but I guess, yeah, it's like we don't influence exactly their, how they're going to experience the results of their actions, but we can try to create a conducive condition for that. You know, I mean, that's the point of having things like an NHS or, or you know, <laughs> meditation centres and whatever. We're trying to create conducive conditions yeah. in the world where people can find healing, you know, they're more supportive for healing. Mm. Yeah. yeah using, using karma is very... Very, yeah, as you said, very cautiously yeah. because people don't understand it and they can yeah. be offended very easily yeah. indeed. Yeah. It could be like it, uh, if, um, you know, uh, an, with an awareness you have uh, drunk something very poisonous somehow. Yeah. Although you didn't know. Right. But that will have an effect on you. That's what, mm -hmm. you know, as you saw social, you read, but 
sometimes you're not aware, you mm. just did it. Mm. Mm. And then when you separate, <coughs> you don't know why. Right, right. And when we say something like karma, yeah. they don't understand the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they become mm. very offensive. So, yeah, you know, it's, it's although it is <laughs> more likely karma, because anything we do, that's what you're going to but we reap anyway. Right. Yeah. So, you know. In a way. I'm not saying you'd mm -hmm. say that to the yeah. person. No, no. Yeah, yeah, that's just, it, that's uh, it, that's it. It just came to me as a, as a, a reason to try yeah. and understand why this yeah. situation is so mm -hmm. difficult. Yeah, so. I mean, I think if it helps you get a handle on a situation, it, yeah, we can look in certain ways to help us understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You see, I think this person, did you say she had a stroke? Yeah, she's a stroke survivor. Yeah. So this means she's brought paralyzed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she is partially. Talk? Can she talk? Mm -hmm. Partially, yeah. A bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something a bit. Just a bit. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. But a lot of it, you, you know, I mean, the but a caring. You see, she's probably suffering from lack of love. Yeah. Everybody mm -hmm. does does physical things, mm -hmm. but real love caring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you see, and that's what you can bring. Yeah. That's yes. the most beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. Just the presence. The, the presence and seeing. Yeah, sometimes okay. the presence I find is difficult because I'm quite a practical person. Yeah. So I'll go in and I'll see all this needs doing this. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, like, well, just to give an example, at the moment there are major water leaks in her house. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard yeah. for me not to fight. Well, yeah, the family sure. know, the social worker knows, you know what I mean? It's yeah, quite hard. sure. You do have to deal with those things, absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's not just about, let's just kind of sit there. But then I <laughs> realise I can't do anything and I must be right. here, actually, because I cause yeah, more trouble. Yeah, I guess so. we have to know our limitations in the situation. And yeah. also when it's leading to kind of stress and agitation, we're probably not going to be that much help anymore. So that's the time to go home and meditate, have a good sleep, yeah. see it fresh well, the next day. I'm just asking people to pray because I can't yeah, that's think lovely. what else to do. Why not? Yeah. And tell her that that's happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the Buddha basically said that karma, I mean, the things we experience in this life, it's due to being born. It's due to having taken birth in the human realm. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to get sick. We're going to experience old age if we're fortunate to live long enough, and we're going to die. You know, that's just part and parcel of the human birth. So it's not necessarily the result of somebody, you know, somebody's bad character or anything like that. It's mm -hmm. just part and parcel mm -hmm. of being in this. World. I mean, with this particular person, it's quite ironic because she spent quite a lot of years mm -hmm. looking after working herself for severely mm -hmm. disabled people. Mm -hmm. you know, she has a really good. But that's heart. not going to stop her from having a stroke. Mm -hmm. No, no, <laughs> no. It's just, it's just yeah. to see the contrast. My now, dad was um, giving blood for years and years and years, and now he's got blood cancer. Mm -hmm. I find that quite ironic, but it's totally unconnected. Mm -hmm. I just think that causality is so complex we can't mm -hmm. even begin to trace it even the arahats, even the fully enlightened monks in the days of the Buddha couldn't mm -hmm. only the Buddha really had a full measure mm -hmm. full picture and that was through being able to see millions of past lives you know, mm -hmm. how beings come into existence how they pass out of existence and, mm -hmm. yeah uh, it's just yeah, it'll just get your head in a complete tangle if you mm -hmm. <laughs> try to go that way. I think all we can really hang on is that karma, as the Buddha defined, is intention. It's in the intention. That's where we're creating our um, future <coughs> happiness or suffering. It's in our, the intentions we're, you know, behind our action. It's not the action itself, it's the intention. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we have to act skillfully, wisely, so that, uh, again, you know, we're developing wisdom alongside that to, purify that intention as much as possible because um, obviously intentions can be a bit mixed but um, that's the seed we can plant you know the kindness and I think I really trust that mm. if we act with kindness even if other people can't see that but we know we're acting with kindness we can kind of feel pretty mm. pretty sure and this is important I think also to protect yourself isn't it to yeah. a certain extent you can very much so so involved, but eventually it all gets too confusing. Yeah. It's interesting, I mean, that you raise that, which is absolutely vital, but that you also say to a certain extent, because the Buddha has said to an absolute extent, I mean, you know, I think especially as women, we often think, okay, I, like, I can give, I can't give 100%, but I can give 90, and I can have 10% for myself, perhaps, you know, mm. but actually the Buddha said, as to others, to ourselves, you know. Um, well, as to ourselves, to others, in fact, so he put ourselves even further. Mm. Yeah. So it's 
So it's absolutely okay to look after our own well-being. It's, in fact, necessary. And so many of the practices, like we were talking about, with the reflection on one's good deeds and, mm. you know, um, reflection on generosity, this kind of thing, it's all for the sake of looking after ourselves, mm. you know, making sure our minds are in the best condition they can be. Mm. Yeah. Anything we do, it is about ourselves, actually. Yeah. Anything. Well, it is, you know, yeah. Hundred <laughs> percent, it is mm. ourselves. Mm. We don't do anything for anybody else. Mm. We think we do. Mm. We think we do. But what we are doing is, uh, let's say we are building our own positive karma mm. or something like that. But the pleasure that we receive by giving, mm. right? For ourselves, yeah. anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not when you are sympathetic or helping other people, yeah. don't think that I am doing it. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you are not doing it. Right, right, right. Yeah. Whatever we are doing, we are doing for, for the self. Mm. Isn't it so? Mm. If we got that in mind, there is nothing that can harm us somehow. Mm. Isn't it? Mm. And what do we do? Hmm? Everything that we, we have, we get it from outside, isn't it? Mm. So the air that we breathe that helps us to do something. Right? The food that yeah. we eat gives us the power to do something or energy. Yeah? And that food doesn't come, we didn't grow it. Yeah? The bees do it. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So somehow if you understand that we are one, there is no giving and taking. Mm. They just do whatever is there to be done. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah? If we do that in that attitude, that way of mm, thinking, mm, mm. I mean, there's nothing that would yeah. come harm. Let's say something harm to you. Okay, no problem. Yeah. And yeah. there is a difference between pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. Now, somebody uh, is suffering, and somebody is pain. Of course, physically, you are you have pain, isn't it? There's suffering when you understand what's going on. Why did that happen? And then you come to terms with it, and no suffering. Mm -hmm. isn't it? Jesus was on the cross. He said. Mm, isn't it? Mm. And he said, forgive those people who don't know what they're doing. Yeah. So a person who is in full pain, still, he could say that. Mm. So he was not suffering. Yeah. Because he did 150% probably or 200%, everything that he had, he gave. Mm. Yeah. 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 We have to think like that. I think. Mm -hmm. And if we can make comfort that person, and I, as somebody said that, Love, yeah, for example, a person that would like Nick and a sympathy, but uh, if you sit down there and talk to them well and, and whatever, all these things and explain to them that you can somehow, and that would help the person yeah, yeah, recover, yeah, wouldn't yeah, it? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Often also being a listener. Yeah. 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 yeah, just, some, just for someone to talk yeah. to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sometimes and just listen and let past know. And the criticism that people criticize, it just shows you the other side of the coin. Because we want to see this, the, first, the, f the one side of the coin okay. and somebody else say something <laughs> that doesn't come in your picture. Mm. And you think it's criticism. Mm. It's something showing the holistic approach to your own being. And now if you take it out of fence, okay, you lose. If you take it as a criticism which you can work on it and, and build up something positive, mm. it's okay, mm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. Because this is duality of life. We see only one side <laughs> and then we don't yeah, see the other yeah, side. Yeah. And somebody show it the mirror. Mm. Oh. Mm. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a good way to look at it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Lovely, thank you.